This episode is brought to you by Podcast Assist. Visit facebook.com slash podcast assist for more info on their flat $30 per hour rate. The country had changed an awful lot politically, socially, and then there's also other aspects that I hadn't covered before because they some things I didn't understand, but some things weren't there. Like one, one I've got a whole chapter now on happiness. The Koreans are amongst the most miserable, depressed people in the OECD. And that wasn't the case 20 years ago. Subscribe with iTunes, Audio Boom, Stitcher, or your favorite podcasting app. And if you enjoy what you hear, like us on Facebook. Also, consider throwing a little cash our way by visiting patreon.com slash koreafm. And find more of our great content on our home on the web, koreafm.net. Barry Welsh's Soul Book and Culture Club recently played host to author Michael Breen, who discussed his book, The New Koreans. Barry Welsh, of course, is a friend of the podcast, and our next episode will feature author Michael Breen's Q&A with the crowd during that Soul Book and Culture Club appearance. However, to better understand The New Koreans and the questions that will be asked in our next episode, I'm joined now by the book's author, Michael Breen. So great to be speaking with you again, Michael. Let's uh, just get right to it. You, of course, came to Korea back in 1982. And as you covered both North and South Korea for several newspapers like The Guardian, The Times and The Washington Times, Barry Walsh described you as, quote, a trained journalist who's lived here for many years and whose connections go right to the very heart of the country. So that being the case, writing about Korea, of course, is right up your alley. However, what's interesting is that this new book, The New Koreans, The Business, History, History and People of South Korea is kind of an expansion of your previous 1998 book, The Koreans, who they are, what they want, where their future lies. So my first question, Michael, is why was the new book necessary? Um, well, that's good. That's, it's funny, Charles. That it's a question I ask myself. I have, um, uh, I mean, it may sound pretentious, but I have a literary agent, and this is... Um, someone who helps you negotiate or your way around the the weird world of publishing and getting contracts. And um, about three or four years ago, she said to me, you've got to update this, Uh, you know, the old book, the Koreans. Uh, I said, oh, do I have to? And she said, well, it's been 10 years since the last update. So just just, um, update the references and throw another chapter on the end. Um, and I said, well, why? I'm not really interested anymore. Uh, and she said, no, 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 Korea is so hot now. Apparently in the publishing world, um, Korea was then and remains a very hot, hot sort of subject. Uh, thanks in large part to, or in some part to uh, Korean authors who, you know, literary figures who are becoming recognized but also thanks to our good friends in North Korea. So, you know, most of the books coming out in English about this peninsula in recent years have been about North Korea. So anyway, so she persuaded me. But once I started, I had three months to do it. And two months later, I just hadn't even started. I couldn't, uh, and I was having a huge sort of writer's block problem. And what I realized was, apart from the fact that the country had changed a lot in 20 years, I also disagreed with my sort of, you know, some of the, a lot of the things I'd said in the previous book. So I ended up having to write a completely new book. And that's the sort of story behind it. And then so for this newer version, the new Koreans, or rather than saying new version, a, a completely different book as the case was just made, what did you find yourself writing about? You you made a really interesting comment just a few moments ago. You kind of disagreed with a lot of the things that you wrote. So did you go back and point out the change in opinion that you now have, or were you also trying to go in different directions that you might have missed in the last book? Um, well, a bit of both. I mean, in the preface, I kind of... Uh, explain what I just said, um, and so uh, the, the the disagreement with was more. I mean, my my feeling for Korea has changed. It's my understanding. I've, I've since since I wrote the first book, I've married a Korean. I've uh, left journalism, went into business, and so you see a whole different side of the society if you're married into a Korean family, and also if you're running a business from when you're a journalist sort of going to press events and interviewing people and stuff like that. 
Um, so a lot of it was just a sort of a deeper uh, sort of relationship with the country. But the, it was also more structurally. I was, I was very sort of reunification focused um, 20 years ago. Um, and I thought that that would be the third miracle. You know, if economics was the first and democracy was the second miracle, then reunification would be the third. But I've sort of changed my opinion about that. I, I don't think um, unification is in the same category as the miracles uh, that have helped South Korea emerge. Um, and so I slightly changed that um you know, I've sort of readjusted that structurally. Uh, and then there was just the the sheer sort of, I mean, 20 years ago, democracy was 10 years old when I wrote it. Uh, actually, it was, yeah. I wrote it in 1997, came out in 98. Now it's 30 years old, and we've had an opposition president elected twice, uh, actually now three times, with Moon Jae-in. Um, and so uh, the country had changed an awful lot politically, socially, economically. And so um, there was just, I had to get all that in. And then there's also other aspects that I hadn't covered before because they, some things I didn't understand, but some things weren't there. Like one, one I've got a whole chapter now on um, unhappiness. The Koreans amongst the most miserable, depressed people in the OECD, and that wasn't the case 20 years ago. So I kind of treat that um, and other things. Something that just came to mind based on the answers you've given me so far, not only has your mind changed perhaps by um, having new experiences and having a longer connection to the Korean Peninsula, what kind of role do you think the, the fact that South Korea itself changes on a dime, if you will, has had to your opinions changing? Do you think it's a little bit of both? Um, yeah, it is. Um, if you bear in mind that I came here in the sort of early 80s and I was a journalist for about 15 years. Um, so back in those days, um, and it's something you'll still see in the expat world, you'll still see today, but particularly in those days, um, and particularly, you know, because I was a journalist and, you know, journalists are, were sort of a um, can sort of tend towards arrogance. You know, you sort of there you're sitting with your friends uh, criticizing the government uh, as if you could do a better job, you know. Um, and expats were universally dismissive of what Korea was doing. And on top of that, so were so were many Korean experts who were like our sources, if you like. So the wisdom was that, oh, you know, there's another crisis around the corner. Whatever the government's doing is useless. Oh, you're trying to, oh, you're putting more money in research and development now. Well, that's not going to work because your educational system is useless, uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, and in the end... The, Korea just continues to surprise people. And so what I've noticed, and it's happened to me as well, is instead of sort of um, being dismissive and saying, well, this won't work, this is not going to happen, you, you withhold judgment. If the Koreans say they're going to do something, they might not achieve exactly what they set out to achieve. And, you know, some things they haven't. Like uh, 20 years ago, they said they wanted to be a financial center. And ironically, then, a lot of expats in banking took them seriously. But, you know, that sort of thing hasn't happened. But most other things, even if they don't get the whole way, they get um, three quarters of the way. And so who would have thought 20 years ago this country would be one of the, the, one of the leading high-tech countries in the world? Nobody you know, there's no sort of wise people out there who can say, yeah, I saw this coming. No, if you're, if you're halfway of an expert, uh, you were negative on Korea, you know. So it's quite an extraordinary change. And I know just now just so much more respect and there's tremendous admiration for the Koreans around the world. Before, it, the admiration used to come from, ironically, from military people. It was people who were familiar with the war or served in Korea and then came back 
in the even in the 70s and the 80s and, and were just astonished by what they saw and then people started saying you know my sacrifice was worth it look at what these people have done that was 30 years ago but you're sort of your you white collar sophisticated experts it took them a lot longer to change their tune and stop sort of acting superior um and uh, i try and sort of capture some of that um in in the opening parts of the book capture that how the analysts and the experts were always of the view that at any time this is as far as korea is going to go and now what i see is is people who are familiar with korea tend to be full of admiration for it uh, and the younger people just think it's cool i mean this is another astonishing thing you tell anybody over 60 30 40 years ago or one day people think this country is the coolest place in the world they'll laugh at you you know so the scale of change is just astonishing and it keeps going it's not like we're it's not like we're done and let's not make the same mistake and say well this is as far as it goes i mean 30 years from now god knows what korea will be like you know Michael, it's been great to have you on here to talk about your book. Um, before we get to the Q&A from that Soul Book and Culture Club uh, event, that'll be our next episode. Just got a couple final questions. Obviously, you wrote this book, and that requires research and things like that, but you obviously also with the, the amount of time, the experience that you've had on the peninsula are quite an expert on Korea. Um, so I'm wondering what your your thoughts are on the current situation facing the Korean peninsula um, really centered around um, the actions of an ally, U.S. President Donald Trump, and then, of course, um, a former part of um, a unified Korea, North Korea. What do you think about what's going on? Well, it's um, it's sort of been going on for quite a long while. Um, I think what we're seeing in America with the new administration, uh, Donald Trump, is is what we've seen with previous administrations where – they they inherit a problem that their predecessor hasn't been able to do anything about. Uh, in fact, um, when the outgoing President Obama told Trump when they met, uh, "This is the one foreign policy. This is the most important foreign policy issue." Uh, when Clinton uh, was going and Bush came in, he said. This is the thing I wish I'd done more about, you know. So I think Trump is sort of, you know, he's appealing. He's trying to be different. He's a new, he's not a political, he's a business person. He's not a, uh, he doesn't talk the language of diplomacy or politics even. So he's trying to sort of come in and uh, um, set a sort of a expectation that I'm going to solve this problem. But I suspect he's going to find what the others found which is um, pressure on North Korea to give up their nuclear weapons is not going to work. They're not going to give them up. The alternative is warfare, which is unthinkable. Your ally, you know, the Americans can't just suddenly launch missiles into North Korea, you know, without Chinese, South Korean and Japanese permission. So that's not going to happen. So what we're going to do is... We either sit and wait for the revolution to come, which it will one day, um, or we kind of nudge it along, um, you know, maybe get the Chinese to sort of um, do something. And I think that seems to be what the policy is. So Obama's policy was called strategic patience. Um, this one is strategic patience with trying to get the China, maybe strategic impatience. I don't know. Somebody called it that. Um, it's not that different, frankly. Uh, I think it's possible to do something on this peninsula with the North Koreans that involves, you know, you ask the question, uh, what is it they want? Why have they got nuclear weapons? What is the point? What, what do they want? Um, there, and the thing that we're sort of forgetting here when we look from the outside is that they feel, and probably rightly so, that given half the chance, we would go in and remove their government and, you know, they'd cease to exist as a, as a separate state. Um, believe me, if, if, the, 
if they collapsed, um, you, know, that, you know, that's possible that could happen. So they, they've, they've got a point. So the possible solution is trying to deal with them on those terms. In other words, peace, peace treaty in the Korean War, recognition, have an American embassy in there, try and drag them into regional agreements on uh, economic matters, even human rights like the Helsinki Agreement uh, in Europe, things like that. Um, on the other hand, if they're, if they're not willing for that, then it's another question of just strategic patience. We just got to sit and wait them out. Yeah. So I think the Trump administration is going through the learning curve and, and that's made us all quite nervous. And there may be some intent in that because the, Ch the Chinese are so nervous. Uh, the North Koreans, by the way, are so nervous that they haven't done a nuclear test. You know that. Um, and the Chinese are nervous that something's going to happen which is making them a lot more serious. And now they're coming out and saying, you know, is North Korea really our friend? Yeah, so, uh, but we'll see. Um, one, one day this will all be over. The peninsula will be reunified. Uh, but how we get there, uh, hopefully with the minimum of bloodshed, um, is anybody's question. And then finally, Michael, to end on a, a bit of a uh, less heavy topic, might there be a third book in this series, something we've talked about just a few moments ago, perhaps The Cool Koreans? Um, well, The Cool Koreans is, um, yeah, no, certainly there's, 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 um, there's definitely I mean, there's scope for so many books about Korea. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm the person to write about The Cool Koreans. <laughs> not your specialty. Well, not not because I'm not uncool myself, but um, a lot of the the cultural side of things I'm personally much less interested in, you know. And I think to to do that well, you have to be pretty passionate about um, you know the K-pop, the movies, the drama, all the things the that have made that cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, and a lot of people are, you know. So I'd I'd sort of hand that one over to somebody else. The, the one that I thought expected at this time to be writing was the Unified Koreans. So, you know, maybe that's uh, 20 years later. I don't know. Um, but that would be uh, that would be the next sort of one in, in my series if I were to do one. I've been speaking with Michael Breen. He's a journalist, author, also mentioned how he's now involved with business and, uh, of course, a Korea expert. He appeared with uh, the Soul Book in Culture Club, which, of course, is always hosted by Barry Welsh recently. And uh, we're going to have a second episode, the one uh, right after this one, that's going to have a Q&A with the audience. And uh, we're just kind of pre-gaming that, if you will, with this little discussion I just had. So, Michael, thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, good luck on perhaps one day being able to put pen to paper on the Unified Koreans. Okay, let's hope. Thanks very much, Chance. I appreciate it. This episode is brought to you by Podcast Assist, offering voiceovers, audio editing and mastering, transcriptions and show notes, episode summaries, and even hosting a podcast on a topic important to you. Visit Facebook.com slash Podcast Assist for more info on their flat $30 per hour rate. Talk radio, music, and podcasts from the Korean Peninsula. Korea FM.net.